Hello, everybody. How's it going, Tabad? How's it going, Seth? How are you? you really guys? good, thank you. I'm really looking forward to this conversation that we're going to have today. I think this is a really important topic, uh, and I know that you guys are a wealth of knowledge and information on this topic, so I'm um, really looking forward to it. Uh, for everyone else, just give us a few moments while we get a few of the speakers up on stage, uh, and as we get the room all sorted out, and then looking forward to diving into this conversation. All right, so Tabad, is there anyone else that we're waiting for right now, or uh, do we want to start brief introductions and kind of the topic at hand? I think Vlad is here also as a speaker. Uh, I see Rafe. Gustavo is free to join as well, Groove. Uh, but yeah, we can get started. Yeah, so uh, why don't we just start with introductions for everyone on the stage. Uh, we'll, so we'll go around, and then uh, after that, we'll kind of dive into things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sounds good. I'll jump in, I guess. So I'm uh, Thibaut Tib on Twitter, a uh, recent contributor to Wasabi Wallet, working on many different things and excited for this uh, This uh, space. It's going to be a good one. Hey, everybody. Uh, I'm Seth, or Seth for Privacy. I'm head of content at Foundation and have a focus on Bitcoin privacy with the, the education I've done in the past and what I'm working on now. Um, so it's kind of where I'm coming from. Well, I'm Max Hillebrand. Uh, I'm also a privacy advocate, open source lover, uh, and have been contributing to Wasabi for a couple of years now. Um, in the meantime, I'm the CEO of CK Snacks, uh, which is the coordinator uh, that that is, well, the CoinJoin coordinator, and uh, we're sponsoring a bunch of uh, contributors to Wasabi Wallet. Hey guys, um, I'm Rafe. I'm also a long-term contributor for Wasabi Wallet and generally very interested in all these like privacy related um, projects. And yeah, very excited to see how this discussion goes today. I feel a little outnumbered here on the uh, only non Wasabi Wallet connected person. So. <laughs> yeah, I know, man. I invited the Samurai Wallet, TDEV and, and Laurent, but they couldn't make it. So maybe another time. It's good that, you know, we're actually having this debate. Yeah, and Vlad, if you want to do an introduction real quick, and then we'll uh, get into the topic at hand. Hi, guys, I'm Vlad, and I'm such a privacy guy that I had my permissions not allowed to access my microphone. So I had to close the call and then enable my phone to access my microphone, get back, raise my hand. So thank you for having me. I do the Bitcoin Takeover podcast. I also do the BTC TK VR open source magazine, which you can download and print for free. And some people call me a Wasabi shill, but I've been a user since early 2019. And I've been constantly watching the project grow and improve. I like what it's doing. I want to give credit to Yuval Kogman for designing the Wabi Sabi protocol, because we're going to talk about, about a lot about what he has created. And yeah, that's pretty much it. Awesome. Thank you for the intro uh, introductions, everyone. Uh, Tebow, maybe I'll kick it over to you to start things off. Uh, I know that this is probably one of the more technical rooms, but uh, if you want to just give a brief overview of what a coin join is, and then uh, after that, kind of a breakdown of what toxic changes, and we can kind of get into the questions and uh, some of the articles that you guys have written. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. So I guess before talking about the coin join, I'll talk about a, a brief, like, intro on Bitcoin transactions because it's always at least one input that is consumed and one output that is created, right? That uh, transaction output is the TX0. And when it's unspent and ready to be spent, we call it the UTXO, so the unspent transaction output. And um, of course, on Bitcoin, the sum of all the current UTXOs, they give you the circulating supply of all the Bitcoin at any given time. Anybody can verify this running full node. This is great but it has some privacy trade-offs, right? And this is the core of Bitcoin, which relies on the UTXO model. 
And so in reality, if you send, let's say you have one BTC UTXO, you want to send 0.3 BTC, you're going to send the entire one BTC UTXO and you're going to get 0.7 BTC back as change, right? And that change output is traceable. It is hard to manage to avoid leaking some personal information. And this is why it's called toxic change because it is in a way you can use like a more fancier uh, parlance, it's deterministically linked to the original input of the transaction. And so Coinjoins can help you reclaim your privacy and deal with the problem of toxic change. Um, Coinjoin, what is it? Well, it's a collaborative Bitcoin transaction. So in some cases, it allows many participants, sometimes hundreds in the case of Wabi Sabi, uh, to send Bitcoin together in one single transaction. And so Coinjoin, in that sense, it helps you hide your transaction history and it makes it very hard to track the flows of funds. And so the connection between the input and output of a transaction is broken. And so all of a sudden you, are, you have what we call fungible uh, UTXOs. So those UTXOs, those unspent transaction outputs, they're not distinguishable from each other. And that's why coin joins are so interesting from a privacy standpoint. However, the problem of toxic change is not entirely gone from coin joins. And so, Today, you have three major implementations who have different strategies to deal with coin joins, um, namely join market. Um, then you have Whirlpool. Those two rely on zero link protocol, which is a coin join design. And we'll, we'll talk about this later, I'm pretty sure. Uh, and then Wabi Sabi, uh, which uses a, a different, uh, sorry, Wasabi Wallet 2.0, which uses the Wabi Sabi coin join protocol, which is a completely revamped design from the zero link protocol. And again, we'll talk about the differences, I'm sure, a bit later. I don't want to overwhelm everybody. Uh, and so, so yeah, I think it, it should be really interesting to uh, discuss the different strategies by which these coin join implementation actually handle toxic change, um, whether, you know, they include it in coin joins, isolate it from coin joins, or outright eliminate it. Uh, and what it means for privacy and for users. And maybe to add some uh, small things about the basics of CoinJoin, um, what we're trying to avoid uh, is to uh, leak the input-to-input -input linkage, uh, as well as the output-to-output -output linkage and the input-to-output -output linkage. So these are kind of the three things that we want to hide. Input-to-input -input linkage is also known as the common input ownership heuristic. And so if you're making a transaction by yourself, which most people are, you can select multiple coins to be spent in the same transaction on the input side. Uh, and then an adversary who looks at this transaction on the blockchain can say that I assume every input belongs to the same person. So we just assume that input-to-input -input linkage uh, is linked to the same person. Um, now, a coin join is by definition a collaborative Bitcoin transaction with multiple users owning multiple inputs uh, in this transaction. Uh, so we literally break the common input ownership heuristic, um, meaning we have that potential to break the link uh, on the input to input side. Uh, so all of a sudden, we no longer know how many inputs one person entered here or, or which inputs belong to the same person. And likewise, on, on the output side. Uh, it, it would be preferable to to not find out that these two outputs belong to the same person. Um, uh, and notice that this is, you know, this is different. Uh, like being able to cluster just the inputs, you might be able to do that without finding out uh, which outputs that person got. Or you could, for example, just cluster on the output side, but not being able to find out what what's up uh, on, on the input, like which users, uh, which inputs belong to that same users. Yeah, no, I think that's some great stuff. Does anyone want to add uh, anything else before we jump into the three different types uh, or the three main ways that currently exist for dealing with the toxic change? Uh, Not necessarily adding anything, but uh, just uh, for the listeners out there, there are some resources, some tweets being pinned in the uh, Twitter space right now where we shared some threads about these strategies. So if you want to read about them at the same time, uh, feel free to uh, check them out. Yeah, definitely. And uh, yeah, Thibaut, I, I think, uh, or anyone can take this. So basically, as you were mentioning, there's kind of three ways that it currently exists. So there is the inclusion of the change in the coin join. 
there's the isolation of the change before the coin join, and then there's the elimination of the change in the coin join. So that's kind of, uh, as you mentioned before, there's kind of the three main implementations of Wasabi, Join Market, Samurai. And Wasabi kind of has two factions. It has Wasabi 1.0 and Wasabi 2.0. Um, yeah, if, if you want to break it down or if anyone wants to talk about those in parallel, those three different uh, distinctions of how the toxic change is dealt with. I guess let me uh, be the join market guy, uh, which is also a project I love and contribute to. Um, so in join market, we have a maker and taker architecture. Um, the taker is the coin join coordinator, meaning he, the taker is a user who uh, brings together the inputs and outputs of different users and writes them well in, into the same transaction. Um, and the taker especially can can set the round parameters, meaning how many inputs should be there or how many makers should be there, uh, as well as very importantly, what is the equal value output amount? So in a joint market transaction, there is going to be one uh, output denomination, let's say 0.2 Bitcoin. And those 0.2 Bitcoin will be like 10 times on the output side. So 10 outputs worth 0.2 Bitcoin. Um, and the taker gets to choose what is this equal amount denomination. Um, and then the taker you now says, okay, cool, I want to make this new transaction and I want to invite makers to add their inputs to this transaction. Uh, so the taker talks to the makers who advertise publicly, hey, I'm willing to coin join for any amount, right? Let's say between 0.1 Bitcoin and one Bitcoin, I'm happy to coin join anything. Uh, the 0 0.2 Bitcoin is within the range, so the taker will, will talk to the maker and say, hey, please add your inputs. Let's say the taker then adds a 0 0.3 Bitcoin input. Uh, uh, sorry, the maker adds a 0 0.3 Bitcoin input. So he receives the 0 0.2 Bitcoin equal amount, the private output, uh, as well as the 0 0.1 Bitcoin change. Uh, in fact, it will actually be 0 0.11 uh, or something like this because the maker uh, gets paid a small fee uh, by the taker. And so the taker is inviting makers into his own transactions. And why would makers ever join the transaction of the taker? Well, because he bribes them. He, he gives them money. Uh, that's a good way to convince people to do what you want. Um, but also important to note, the taker pays for the mining fee uh, of all the makers. And so makers can earn effectively money. Like they, they don't have to pay for the mining fee and they do get a liquidity fee from the taker. Um, but this means that so because the taker dictates, I want to have 0 0.2 on the output side, basically no maker is going to have the exactly right amount on the input side. Right? So most likely the maker will add more money on the input side than the equal denomination and not exactly that amount. Uh, which means if you have more money than the standard amount, you will have the change amount, which will be given to you in the change output. Uh, and this change output can be tied to the input sum. So let's say if, a, if the maker added two inputs, um, uh, then we can see that these two inputs plus, uh, minus the equal amount, so the private output amount, equals the, the change output. So here we can have an input to output linkage, uh, including an input to input linkage. So because of that change amount, we can say that these two inputs pretty surely belong to the same maker. So we have an input to input linkage and an input to output linkage. So these two inputs have paid for this change output. Yeah, thanks for that, Max. Uh, Seth, I see your hand up. Uh, yeah, if there's anything you want to comment or if I was going to say, if you want to also denote and talk about the, the Samurai uh, implementation or Whirlpool implementation, that'd be great. Yeah, yeah, I figured I'd jump in and, and handle the, the Samurai side of things. Um, so when you look at Samurai Wallet, the approach that's taken to preventing a user from harming themselves with this toxic change um, is to isolate that toxic change. So Tebow went into it well on his, his article. Um, but essentially what happens is when you go to gain privacy through Samurai Wallet, you use their coin join protocol called Whirlpool. And Whirlpool has a set of denomination pools. So essentially when you join funds, you go and bring them in, you want to gain privacy. Those funds have to get broken down into the correct denominations for whatever coin join pool you want to use. Um, that can be 0.5 BTC, 0.05, 0 0.1, 0 0.01. 
Um, there are multiple denominations. When you do that, what happens is you do an initial transaction that essentially preps your input for going through the coin join round, which is called the TX0. And so that takes whatever your inputs are, breaks them up into the right denominations. So let's say you have uh, one BTC and you want to mix in the 0 0.05 BTC pool. It'll break down your one BTC input into uh, all of those 0 0.05 BTC outputs. And then you'll have the amount necessary to pay for fees in those outputs as well. And then you'll have that change output, which we've, re we've been referring to as toxic change. And the reason I call it toxic change, just to harp on that point a little bit more, is that that change gains no anonymity or privacy through mixing. And essentially that change links directly back to the wallet that entered that mixing round. And so if you use that change, especially if you combine it with other toxic change, or if you combine it with funds that have already been mixed and you're trying to spend, you are revealing that you are the same person whenever you do that. Um, but the approach that Samurai Wallet does is they isolate that change they set it aside in a separate account that you cannot easily spend from intentionally so that you can't use that toxic change on accident and harm your privacy on the, on the other side. And so that your inputs when you're mixing are exactly what you need. There's no change coming out of the mixing round itself. You get exact denominations, no change to worry about. But that doesn't mean that you have that this toxic change that you then have to deal with later. Uh, and there's kind of three main approaches. One is if it's a small amount that you can't mix in a, like a, a smaller Whirlpool um, denomination, you could either just sit on it and not worry about it and just wait for maybe a better privacy technology to come along in the future, or you could take it, you could swap it for something like Monero on an instant exchange to just be able to have some way to spend those funds moving forward. Or if it is a large enough amount, you can continue to mix down into smaller pools within Whirlpool until you're left with just a very small change output. Because um, eventually, at, at some point, it's not a spendable amount. And so you'll just be harming your privacy if you try to combine that with anything else. Um, so those are kind of the core approaches. It makes sure that the, heart, the user can't unintentionally harm themselves by spending that toxic change. But it does take that extra prep transaction called the TX0 on the input side. But that does guarantee that in the actual coin join transaction, there's no change, there's no toxic linkage, there's no deterministic links. So it's a powerful approach, but it, it isn't necessarily the most block space efficient approach. Yeah, thanks for that, Seth. Uh, Tebow, do you want to go through Wasabi 1.0 and Wasabi 2.0? I know they're kind of uh, different in the way that they handle them. Yeah, I mean, I'd love to, but I think uh, Max Hillebrand on this call is more suited for that. He's been working on it for years. Yeah, uh, I guess I was open enough for uh, Tebow or, or anyone else that wants to take it. Go ahead, Max. Okay, um, so Wasabi 1.0 uh, includes the change directly into the coin join, uh, which is similar to join market. Um, however, there are some important differences compared to join market. There is no maker and taker differentiation. Like the end user is not the coin join coordinator. Um, the coin join coordinator is a third party, and this coin join coordinator does not have inputs on the co in this coin join. And so technically, he's not a participant of the coin join. Um, and uh, so, however, still that coordinator similar to, to Samurai, uh, uh, it dictates the round, the, the, the equal denominations for this round. Um, and in the Wasabi case, uh, we started out uh, with 0 0.1 being the only standard denomination or, or equal denomination uh, in a coin join round. Uh, so very similar to join market, right? So we have one, a bunch of inputs and then one equal amount uh, that multiple outputs have, plus a bunch of change coins. Uh, and here again, if you have registered multiple inputs, uh, then an outside observer can, can look at the change value plus the equal denomination and see which input sums uh, go to, uh, yeah, sum up to this. Uh, and that can lead to revealing the common input ownership. Uh, and again, the common uh, the input to output linkage uh, to the change output uh, uh, right so the uh, the standard or the equal amount uh, is private but the change output can be linked to the input and the way wasabi 1.0 dealt with it uh, is 
Uh, well, so it was sent to the same account derivation path. Wasabi only uses one derivation path uh, and not multiple accounts. Uh, however, in the user interface, it was denoted with a big red shield saying Anon set one, a non private coin, uh, contrarily to the equal denominations, which had an anonymity set, let's say 50, uh, and a green shield associated with it. And when you spend, uh, you know, you would either select only all the private coins uh, by by default, um, and if you would, if you were to select private and non-private coins, there there is a warning displayed. Um, well, ultimately, this this does require some knowledge of of the Bitcoin UTXO model, and and coin selection is all notoriously difficult. Uh, so this was a big point of friction in in Wasabi 1.0. Um, in addition, that we did, I believe, with Wasabi 1.1. Uh, was a multi-round, uh, sorry, a multi-denomination round. Uh, so uh, th this was actually an idea that was uh, brought to light by Yuval. Uh, nothing much uh, that uh, that Vlad mentioned earlier. Um, uh, so here, kind of his his early ideas came uh, came out about adding multiple equal denominations. Uh, so we had 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.8. Uh, 1.6, 3.2, and so on. So always doubling an exponential series of equal denominations. Um, another important note is that every round, this equal denomination was slightly adjusted. It was never exactly 0 0.1. It was a range between like 0 0.11 and 0 0.9. Um, and with every subsequent round, the equal denomination was slightly lower. Uh, this was to ensure that at least one person did not receive a change output. So basically, the poorest guy didn't pay any fees and got didn't get a change output. Um, and that, yeah, that removed the the need for change for at least one person, but uh, it had a lot of other weird downsides, especially that then, yeah, I can explain later how we improved on that with, with 2.0. Um, so, yes, uh, I think in regards to 1.0, that is about everything. Fip, did I miss anything? Well, Max, there is also something to be said about the fact that you could see both UTXOs in your wallet. And even if they were marked with different colors, you could try to consolidate them, but you would get this warning message that it's a bad idea. But in practice, if you ignore the message, you could make this mistake, which basically defeats the purpose of a coin join. And I guess this is a very important situation, which led to the optimizations that Yuval has made in the Wabi Sabi protocol. Because I guess part of the criticism for Wasabi 1.0 was that newbies were making consolidations that led to mistakes that basically defeated the purpose of a coin join. Yes, exactly. The user experience was a bit clunky. That that was the main uh, the main issue I think that the community had for uh, for 1.0. Um, and um, yeah, it was basically a burden that was passed on the user. As Max said, you had to be aware of the UTXO model, how to do coin control properly, how to properly label your UTXO, and so on and so forth, which, of course, adds complexity to the uh, to the overall UX. Um, I think Rafe had some points also to make on the uh, 1.0 and 2.0 distinction. Uh, yeah, thanks. So, you know, like all of these uh, three coin join implementations that we now talked about, they are basically like zero, like uh, zero link based and they all seem to have this like same problems uh, even though they have a little bit of like different implementation but they all have these same problems so if you have a certain denomination no matter what it is you're not gonna necessarily be able to um, like you are very likely not gonna have exactly that amount when you go into that coin join so you either will have to consolidate multiple inputs together revealing the common input heuristic or the ownership which is bad for your privacy and also if you don't have exactly the uh, the right amount you will have or like you can have some extra and you will have then the toxic change like these were basically the problems that all of these three coin join implementations had and 
there's different ways of kind of handling then the toxic change and everything. But what we try to do with 2.0 is kind of acknowledge these problems. And we try to do like totally different kind of approach, trying to actually solve some of the problems. Like, for example, um, like whatever the denomination you have, uh, you know, you, like the, the fact that you're going to have to consolidate multiple smaller inputs together to be able to participate in it, uh, like that is something that we really, really had to fix. And there is no really way around it. So that's kind of like where we started thinking about 2.0 and how it got built up. But I think Max is uh, the right person to explain that one. Um, I would maybe preface it with uh, the the question of what does an outside observer know and what does the coordinator know? Uh, and that is different for, for each of these implementations. Um, for example, in join market, the coordinator, the taker, knows everything. He knows which inputs come from which maker and which outputs, including the equal amount private output, the taker can link it to each maker. Um, and so there's no blinding in the coin join coordination happening, which is why I would not call join market zero link, by the way. The zero link paper was outlining a specific application of the Chaumian blind signature um, eCash protocol to ensure that the coordinator does not learn uh, the linkage of inputs to outputs, that there's zero link on input to output against the coordinator as an adversary. Uh, and this is achieved by utilizing, well, basically eCash as anonymous access rights token. So you, you you get an access right token when you register an input that used to be a Jomian blind signature. Uh, and then if you want to register an output, you have to present or to spend this eCash token back to the coordinator. And the coordinator allows only outputs that are registered if they present this eCash credential. And because these eCash credentials are perfectly private, uh, like 100% theoretically perfect anonymous, with the anonymity set of all users in this in this round, uh, we have great privacy and the coordinator cannot link inputs to outputs uh, as much as any outside observer. And so the coordinator does not have any additional information. Um, however, there's there's problems here. Um, with what we used, uh, it, uh, old idea from Gregory Maxwell in 2013, Chalmian blind signatures, uh, the value of the eCash token uh, basically depends on the on the private key that signed it. Um, so if you have a, an equal amount of 0 0.1 Bitcoin, you have one private key that signs the eCash tokens that allow people to register the 0 0.1 Bitcoin uh, output. But then if you have the 0 0.2 Bitcoin denomination, that's a different private key. Okay, so each denomination is, is a separate pot of privacy, so to say. Within one denomination, you're perfectly private, but the coordinator is sure that a 0.1 token is very different from a 0.2 token. And so the amount of the token is public knowledge um, and, and that or knowledge to the coordinator, I guess. Um, and so this leads to problems. Um, for example, that you can only have a limited amount of denominations, because if you would want to have uh, like a, a, a unique key for, for each Satoshi amount, well, you would have millions, uh, billions of different private keys needed to represent each of these denominations. Um, and that's not just computationally expensive and bandwidth expensive, that also decreases your privacy. Right? Because remember that there is no privacy across pools, across different private keys. So if you're the only one that registered exactly 0.1234567 Bitcoin, well, your anonymity set is one, and the coordinator can again link your activity. Uh, so that's a problem. Um, and that's, by the way, why Samurai uh, uh, choose to have the TX0 transaction so that you prepare your input amount to be exactly that value that you need so that you can, with one single private key, with one single standard denomination, you, uh, you can make the coin join. And you prepare your input so that you have a one input, one output uh, part in that coin join transaction with just one private key that does the join and blind signatures. Um, uh, and well, it, it's so the, the reason why coin joins, especially Samurai and Wasabi 1.0, uh, have this single standard denomination model 
And why everyone was thinking about it for in, in the past was because of these strong and blind signatures. Um, and well, we realized that with having this limited cryptography where the value of the eCash token is, is known, we just can never get rid of, of the change problem. It will, it will always be there. Uh, and so we set out in, in the Wasabi Research Club um, to find a better cryptography that allows us to coordinate those coin joints better. Uh, and we stumbled upon this well, fringe cryptography paper um, that introduced key verified anonymous credentials, uh, which for all intents and purposes is a blind signature, just like Chaumian uh, or, or uh, Schnorr blind signatures. Um, and what we introduced on top of that uh, is uh, uh, homomorphic value encryption uh, and Pedersen commitment, uh, quite similar to what Monero uses or the liquid sidechain, uh, which basically hides the amount uh, of, of something. Uh, in the Monero case, it hides the amount of the inputs and outputs. Uh, and in the Wabi Sabi case, it hides the amount of the eCash credential, uh, meaning now the coordinator just has one single private key, so to say, and he can create these credentials but the value of the credential is completely unknown. Um, so it is between 5,000 Satoshis and 40,000 Bitcoin. Um, and that that new eCash system allows us to coordinate coin joins with arbitrary amounts uh, privately. Um, I, I see that Seth has his hand up. So before I continue this enormous rant, <laughs> please go ahead. I would say go ahead and finish up. I just I have some some questions that I'd love to get clarified around Wabi Sabi itself. So I'll let you let you wrap up, and then I can jump in with some questions. Okay, cool. Uh, thanks. So now we have this new anonymous eCash system that that has anonymous amounts, meaning now you can register an arbitrary amount input, um, zero point one two three four five Bitcoin, right? And you get an eCash credential that's worth exactly the amount of one single input. And so you no longer have to combine multiple inputs to get a, a credential, um, as to some extent is with uh, Samurai because of the TX0. There you have to combine multiple inputs to, to get your standard denominations. And with Wasabi, you have to do that too, right? If you have less than 0 0.1 Bitcoin, which is the smallest standard denomination, you have to consolidate multiple inputs, up to seven inputs, to be able to get that amount. With Wabi Sabi or Wasabi 2.0, you can register each input regardless of what value it has. You can register it by itself and get these anonymous amount credentials. And you have the anonymity set of all the users in the round, um, regardless of what denomination they have. So different to these strong and blind signatures. Um, and then later in, in output registration, because you have these anonymous uh, uh, eCash tokens, you can change the amount of them, right? So let's say you register a 0.123 input, so you get an eCash credential worth 0.123. You can split it up into, let's say, three credentials, 0 0.1, 0 0.02, and 0 0.03, or whatever, right? Uh, now you have a new set of credentials with arbitrary values that you have chosen. Uh, and later in output registration, you can present each of these credentials separately under a new Tor identity to register each of your outputs. So both your inputs and your outputs are registered completely separately with a unique Tor identity and with a new eCash credential that is not tied to your other inputs or outputs or the inputs and outputs from other users. Um, so this enables you to register in the coin join any amount of inputs that you want without the coordinator learning that these belong to the same person and any amount of outputs that you want with arbitrary values. Um, and this means the coordinator no longer dictates to you about the denominations or the number of inputs that you're allowed to do. Um, the coordinator is a uh, a lot more hands-off, a lot more complexity is on the client side. The client, the Wasabi 2.0 client, your wallet on desktop, got a lot more smarter with this upgrade. Um, because now we can be flexible about how many inputs do I register? Which value of these inputs should I register? Uh, and then on the output side, how many outputs should I register? This is really important because most likely if you have 
an arbitrary value on the input side, um, you can like break it down into, well, you could keep it as just one output, put the entire value that you have on the input side minus fees onto one single output. But then most likely there is not going to be a single other user that has exactly this weird output amount that is just your input sum, because that's again something arbitrary, right? You you register whatever amount you have in your wallet and that's difficult to plan or prepare. Um, so in many cases, it makes sense to split up the value that you have in this coin join into multiple outputs. Um, and the big question is now, now that the client has the ultimate control and responsibility over which amounts do you want to register on the output side, well, for the first time we have to ask, well, damn, which amount do I want? <laughs> Especially because you don't know the amounts that other users will register. Right? If the complexity is now on the client side and not dictated by the server, each client might behave differently. And, and then the question of how do we coordinate in this somewhat anarchic set of, of users that just can do whatever they want. Um, and that was an extremely, extremely difficult challenge to solve and way more difficult than the cryptography stuff. That was the easy part in hindsight. This is the real shit. Like, how does the client choose which inputs to select and how many inputs? And then how does the client choose? Or by the way, the, when you register your inputs, you do not know the inputs that other users register because that's happening right now and in the future. And right? so you don't know how many uh, how many inputs are there, or what's the value of them um, necessarily. Uh, and then same with the outputs. Right? If you want to register your output, at this point, you know which inputs have, the use, have other users registered, but you still don't know which outputs will they register and which values will those outputs have. Um, and so this, again, a very complex problem. And our initial solution to this is to define a set of standard denominations uh, that are very carefully chosen. Um, so these are powers of two, powers of three, uh, and powers of 10 in the one, two, five series, uh, plus multiple thereof. So there's, I think, 97 standard denominations that we have defined. Um, and the client prefers to register these standard denominations. Um, we even further reduce the amount of denomin denominations based on the value of which inputs are currently registered. Um, and so this basically means we have somewhat of a shelling point. Uh, CoinJoin clients, Wasabi clients, uh, will, uh, will behave somewhat similarly, uh, depending on the current coin join round, um, but still with a lot of randomness introduced. Um, so the same client will behave differently. Even if you would see the exact same coin join on the input side, the, the chosen outputs would be different the next time around because there's oh, computer randomness introduced. Um, so this, again, to sum up, gives the client a lot of flexibility and he can choose to get these standard denominations. Uh, and a lot of people will choose the same standard denominations. So we have classical Anon set. The same denomination, like 0 0.1 Bitcoin, um, is going to be represented like 20 times uh, in this transaction. Uh, so we have a classical anonymity set. But the really cool thing is, contrary to any other uh, CoinJoin implementation in the past, now you, the client can choose which denominations he has. Uh, and he can easily move in between denominations within the same round. And so, well, how do you know that this user has a 0 0.2 Bitcoin output or two times 0 0.1 Bitcoin output? And that that is both that both could be the case. So you don't just get privacy within the same denomination; you get privacy across the standard denominations um, because they have what's known as a low hemming weight. It's very easy or very efficient to decompose uh, into these standard denominations. Uh, and so what we found that regardless of which input value you have, uh, in most cases, you can express this input value minus fees in less than eight outputs. So like six outputs, four outputs, um, any input value can be broken down into these, uh, which means for most cases, you will not create an output that is a non-standard denomination, 
right? So something that's that's not this powers of two, powers of three, etc. Um, meaning that every output is a standard denomination, um, which means you at least get that privacy across the different denominations. And then most likely, other users will also have chosen the same denomination by random chance. Uh, and then you get the classical anonymity set within the same denomination. Um, the end result, in any case, though, uh, is that we have very little change, basically no change. And we could define change in two ways. First, the, the worst kind of change is a non-standard denomination. So something that's not the power of two, three, or 10. And, and uh, Or it might be a standard denomination, but it's the only output in this coin join with this denomination. Um, that might happen as well. Uh, very rarely, uh, and especially for whales, um, because ultimately this is a liquidity problem uh, and size matters. And if you're a whale with like a thousand Bitcoin and you're swimming in a transaction with tiny goldfish, you know, that each have, have like 0.1 Bitcoin, well, you're going to get a, a change that's like 990 Bitcoin. Um, and your change then can, it's going to be a non-standard denomination and it's going to have one anon set. Uh, and there's only one input that could have paid for such a large output, and it's the whale input. Um, but unless you're the richest guy, which like in Wasabi terms is, if you have less than 10 Bitcoin, you're going to be one of the small fish swimming around in this pool of standard denominations. Um, one final addition to say is, contrary to Wasabi 1.0, and a bit more similar to Samurai, now we have predetermined standard denominations that do not change across rounds. Remember, in 1.0, each round had a slightly lower equal denomination than before. Uh, that's why it's quote unquote not a standard denomination, just that equal denomination for this round. Um, but with one with 2.0, because we have these standard denominations, when you remix, so when you register a coin join output, which is a standard denomination, and you put that on the input side of the next coin join, you're going to have a standard denomination on the input side of the coin join as well. Right? Uh, and not just is it a standard denomination, most likely another user from another previous coin join round registered the same standard denomination. So you have anonymity set on the input side as well. Right? And, and this means now we generate an anonymity set and ambiguity across denominations on both the input and the output side. And we completely eliminate the, the need to create a non-standard output, um, which, which would be a non-private change. Yeah, go ahead, Seth. Uh, Max, that was a, a great rant. I enjoyed it, but Seth, go ahead. Yeah, sure, I can, I can jump in. So I think an interesting point that you mentioned at the end is that I think you'll describe it as a change elimination protocol, but there actually is change. You're just including it in the mix and hoping that there's enough similar outputs to cover it. So it's kind of like an in-between of the previous approach and the current one. And normally changes is not included, which is, is definitely interesting. Um, I think the main question that I have is because all of the amount decisions are shifted to client side rather than coordinator side, how can a client be sure that it will gain a reasonable amount of privacy, a reasonable an onset when it goes to mix, if it doesn't know what the other output amounts within the mix are? How am I supposed to know that my client won't choose output amounts that are not shared by anyone else in that mixing round and thus gain very, very little traditional anonymity? And then I guess the, the second question would be, how do you actually measure the anonymity provided by that idea of inputs not necessarily being mapped by output by amount to outputs, uh, and thus theoretically gaining the anonymity set of every input that could have included that output denomination potentially? Is there a way that you're measuring that or showing that to be provably effective? I know that big numbers sound good to people, but I, I would love to hear more on how you're actually measuring and ensuring that that approach actually provides privacy and isn't just obfuscation through numbers. Yep, go ahead. 
Gabe, you have your yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, guys, I had a, a point on uh, Seth's point around uh, change, change inclusion in, in Wabi Sabi. Um, it's toxic change elimination. And so ultimately, you're still getting change back to your wallet, right? It's just that that change is not deterministically linked to your initial original input that you consumed in that coin join transaction, right? This but is the it, key. It it's could like, be. Like in the in the exact example that Max gave at the end, if you have by far the largest input, you would have yes. a change output that is deterministically linked back to you. I mean, there's no uh, hundred hundred percent. There's no denial. It's deterministically linked, and this is the exception of a lonely whale, like a really big whale, you know, swimming alone in a big pond of uh, goldfish. That whale for sure is going to have to coin join multiple times until that deterministic link of the change is gone because the change output is a standard change output from the 79 denominations that Wabi Sabi offers in the, in the coin join implementation. So it's pretty interesting because it kind of makes you want to revisit the definition of change. And I think a lot of people in, in Bitcoin, they assume that change has to be deterministically linked to your original input that you consumed in the transaction, right? But it, it doesn't have to be in, in, in Wabi Sabi. Like you're, you're literally, if you're not a whale, a lonely whale, uh, you're literally breaking that that um, that state of affair for a change, I guess. And now change is part of that big pond of, oh, maybe it's linked to that input or that output. And, and it's very hard to know. Um, and yeah, you're assigning it a probabilistic link instead of a deterministic certain link. And that's, that's pretty, uh, pretty powerful and pretty interesting. That, that, yeah, that's the key point. Yeah, and when I, I think my main concern with an approach like that is that it doesn't give a surety to the user of what they can expect of privacy on the other end of mixing. And that's one of the things that I think is very beneficial in the approach that's taken by Samurai Wallet is because you know change will be excluded at the beginning and you know that that change will be set aside, not easily spendable, etc., you know the privacy you're gaining from every route of mixing you do. You know what kind of entropy you're gaining. You know what an onset you're gaining, no matter what. There, there are no exceptions. That is what happens. But when you introduce this approach, you're ultimately introducing the risk of potentially not having strong privacy on the other side and it being determined by multiple different factors, which I think is dangerous because people think, okay, I mixed my funds. They're private now. But they might be. They might not be. You're saying that based on the amounts that normal people would be mixing, they probably are, but it's dangerous when we talk privacy tools that don't guarantee privacy when the thing that's supposed to have privacy happens and instead makes it reliant on other factors, most of which are outside of a user's control. And yeah, I mean, it, these are all great points, by the way. The isolation strategy is is interesting in, in some ways, but if you look at Wabi Sabi again, you, you said you talk about privacy guarantees. Um, and this is where Wabi Sabi introduced a much more conservative scoring than a non-set, which is a non-scoring. A non-score, basically, if you look at, so a non-set is, you know, you have one denomination output of 0.1 BTC. If in a coin joint transaction, there are 10 of these 0.1 BTCs, you have an non-set of 10, right? Um, and with Wabi Sabi, because you have, you can register multiple inputs and multiple outputs in a given coin join without linking input to input or output to output. And of course, input to output, um, the wallet itself is going to compute a local score to tell the user, Hey, this is the level of privacy you get. And it's always much more conservative than the, uh, than the non set. So a non set is kind of a, it's a public on-chain metric that anybody can compute if they look at a transaction, at a coin join transaction, right? Anybody can agree on a given set, on a given a non-set. However, a non-score is client-specific. And so this is where you're getting that privacy guarantee because the client is going to tell you, hey, that a non-score you got for that output, which is non-standard because you're a lonely whale, is not good enough in terms of, of privacy guarantees. Coin join again. Right, until you're getting to that score where you're gonna get that nice green 100% privacy score on your Wasabi 2.0 client, which says, okay, now you have sufficient a non-score 
um, to meet your privacy goals and your and and achieve strong privacy guarantees. So in that sense, you get those privacy guarantees. It's just a different scoring. And I think a lot of users don't truly understand what a non-score is. We have those discussions in the team. It's like, oh, well, how do we explain the non-score? What does it mean? Like, can you show us a formula to, to just put it on Twitter and, and explain it really well and simply? And the fact of the matter is it's very complicated. Uh, it's still being worked on, improved on, and making you know, made more robust. But uh, it, it gives you a, a different view on, on privacy guarantees that are very strong. So if, if I could hop in re really quick, Seth, I actually wanted to respond to the comment about change partitioning in transaction zero uh, versus doing it in the coin join itself. Um, I think this is a complete fallacy and it makes absolutely no difference in terms of privacy in the coin join whatsoever, peeling change off before the coin join or during the coin join. Because just think about the links that you are trying to protect um, between that change and mixed outputs. What you're trying to protect is a link between that change output and the actual mix outputs. Now, if we look at Wasabi 1.0 um, instead of Wabi Sabi and compare that to Samurai, what is the information you glean from observing a change output? You learn the input that it came from. You learn the first mixed transaction that that input participated in. And there is no linkage between the derived mixed denomination outputs and that change whatsoever unless you actually spend them together in the same transaction. Now, in the case of Samurai, you have transaction zero, which breaks things up into mixed denominations and then breaks the change off. But you still see transparently on the blockchain exactly which first mixed transaction each of those mixed denomination outputs go into with no link between the change. In the case of Wasabi 1.0, you see that the change output was created, and you know a certain number of mixed denominated outputs were created in that transaction, but you still do not see any linkage between those specific mixed denomination outputs and the change output. So in terms of breaking the change off before the coin join, in the coin join, it makes absolutely zero difference in terms of anonymity or privacy, like whatsoever. Yeah, that's a good point. Mm -hmm. I think the bigger deal is is separating it in a way that's not spendable by the user by default, rather than that it's peeled off in TX0 or in the, in the coin join round. Yeah. I think that's a good point. And one more one small point note here is, oh, as well, is, is just that even if you have a non-standard change output, if it is small enough and if there's enough other users with similar input or output values, then you still get at least some ambiguity. It, it might not hold up to rigorous scrutiny, you know, but at least it's not as easy as, you know, looking at the largest input and the largest output. Um, it, it does become non-trivial uh, to, to do it um, in the sense of you just looking at a block explorer, at least with current technology. Uh, yeah, if I may, I would just want to recap a little bit, like uh, all of these four different implement implementations that we've talked about now. So like the first three, they had this problem where you had to, you know, have a certain denomination. And if you had below it, you basically had to consolidate multiple inputs together and reveal the common input uh, ownership to be able to participate in the coin join. Or if you had more than the denomination, you had a toxic change. Now, what happened with 2.0? Well, each input is now registered separately. So there is no way to, even for the coordinator, to know which inputs actually belong together or are coming from the same user. So that is already like a huge breakthrough in Bitcoin like privacy. Uh, now, then also the fact that like there's basically usually no change. So we had to go through like a, a philosophical discussion uh, internally in Wasabi about like what is actually toxic change. So, you know, is there a difference between a change and a toxic change? Like toxic change is probably the one that is deterministically linkable. But what if there's a, a change 
but it's not deterministically linkable. It's just like probabilistically linkable. So for example, in a VV2 coin join, um, it would mean that there is a bunch of inputs, different sizes, there is a bunch of outputs also. And you have one of the small outputs in there, and there is no other equal denomination in this coin join round. But it's kind of impossible for you to know which input did come from, or if it is connected to some other output. So we could call it a change, but it's at least not toxic change anymore. So that is also like pretty darn good. The only thing it argues is just that it's not not toxic. It's just potentially less toxic. It, it's again when there's not a guarantee of what level of privacy you're gaining with that. Yes, there may not be a 100% deterministic link, but if there's a 95% probability that these are linked together, it it's and essentially the same to a bad actor like Chainalysis, who are more than happy to make guesses and, and jump in on that on that front. But I mean, Seth, you you cannot say ever that anything is 100% deterministically like unlinked. That there is no probability of analysis. Like you cannot make claims like that in a coin joint because you are ultimately assuming honest behavior from all the other participants. Like half of your round in Whirlpool could just be chain analysis with a modified client keeping a hundred different disconnected outputs registered, pretending to be separate wallets. Like you cannot honestly make a claim that any type of coin join system is perfectly like obfuscated or perfectly deterministically unlinked like that because you cannot guarantee that honest behavior from other participants like that. It's literally impossible. Like claims like that are, are just dishonest. Yeah. And there's, I just to, there's one, yeah, well, one interesting yeah, tidbit of the history of, of Wasabi 2.0 research um, because the, the question of how do we do a coin join coin selection that works when you don't know how other users behave. It's like, I cannot overstate how fucking difficult of a problem this is. Like, this is crazy. This is absolutely insane. Um, and so we're, we're definitely a bit lost here. Um, and it took us quite a while to get even a solution that was somewhat decent. Uh, this is all documented in GitHub, uh, Nopara 73 slash Sake, uh, where we did some uh, simulations of of coin join users uh, giving them different uh, client side code to to run with and there was a lot of experimentation on things like for example which should be the standard denominations um and then uh, how how should we choose among them uh, especially then considering that um it is very easy to break any input amount into just private outputs if if you create many many outputs um that's a very easy solution to get a lot of privacy. Um, but the big problem is that this comes at a cost uh, because we're dealing with block space here. And if you create too many outputs, then you consume. You're inf it's like an infinite blow up of the UTXO set that, that cannot scale. Um, so at, at, at some point, it makes financial sense to create a non-standard amount change. Um, and so, the, the but the crucial thing that we learned is this depends on the size of the coin join, on the number of inputs. Um, even the current, like rather optimized coin selection algorithm that we have, it works really badly if there's less than 50 inputs. If there's less than 50 inputs, you're gonna have a lot of standard denominations with just one anonymity set and a lot of non-standard change outputs, uh, like or like non-standard amounts on the output side. Uh, also with one anonymity set. Um, and only when you reach more than 50 inputs do you really start to see high efficiency in the sense that there is no standard denomination that does not have an onset and that there is not a single non-standard denomination output either. Um, and so that's why now in Wasabi 2.0, as we're running in production, we have a minimum input amount of 150. If there's less than 150 input, the coin join does not continue. Um, uh, and this means that there is actually some decent assurance of privacy that that we get just based on the 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 simulation analysis that we did, and given the quite substantially larger uh, increase from like at 50 inputs, it starts getting okay, 
uh, and at 150 Bitcoin uh, inputs, it's it's very good. And we can go even higher, you know, 300, 400, 600 inputs. Uh, and at that level, uh, the assurance that you have at least some anonymity set for basically any denomination, again, unless you're the mega whale, is rather high. Um, but still, regardless, the client makes this privacy analysis after the coin join transaction. Um, so as the coin join is finalized, signed, confirmed on the blockchain, then the client goes through and sees, okay, so what level of anonymity set did I actually gain? And that depends on what was the anonymity set of your inputs and uh, the anonymity score, sorry. And then what's the anonymity set of the outputs uh, that gets reduced into the anonymity score at a very conservative rate. Um, so in many cases, the coin join robot is going to say, okay, this is not yet good enough. We have to register this coin into the next round, um, for example, because it was the lonely whale, right? So these quote unquote privacy flaws are gracefully handled client side because the wallet will not spend that non-private change output of the whale. Uh, it will tell them, hey, this is not yet private. Can you break down the Anon score and the way that you actually measure that anonymity provided anymore? I know Thibaut said that it's a little bit hard and you know, I've been struggling to kind of make that quantifiable, but I'd love to hear more about how you measure that because that's the core of how you decide if an output should be mixed more or can be spent or can't be spent, et cetera. Can I take this one? Yeah, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, it's a very difficult topic, this Anon score, and it is like something we have to say already at this point. It is only the best possible way of calculating the privacy of the people, uh, like the, uh, for these coin joins for the specific outputs. Um, like it's just the past, best one that we have. Um, and it's kind of like a modified version of Anon set. So, uh, well, just to go back a little bit, uh, there's kind of like three so-called privacy guarantees of uh, Wasabi 2.0. And Napara, uh, he actually went and created an awesome article explaining these three privacy guarantees. So one is that the more inputs there are, there is like the likelihood that there's going to be multiple uh, like equal denominations. It gets higher and higher. And like Max said, when it gets like 150 inputs or like 300 or something like that, it's going to be like very, very likely that there's going to be multiple equal amount uh, for equal amounts for like all of the de denominations. Now that is good. That provides us an onset. That is one privacy guarantee. Now there's also like the um, the fact that now in Wasabi, you cannot really know uh, how many inputs that this user has uh, into how many outputs did it break, uh, did he break the amount into. And, you know, all of these kind of nuances, like it makes it really, really difficult to try to analyze uh, Wasabi coin joint transactions because there's kind of like this possibility of you breaking down your amounts in many different ways. Uh, so you don't really know it. It's it's kind of like another way of kind of like making it difficult for any analyzer to figure out like what really happened over here. Now the third one, which is not really like a guarantee, you know, it's just like a practical thing that we've noticed is that it is very difficult to try to even create a probability table for a coin join transaction as large as Wasabi 2.0 coin joins. Like if you have 300 inputs and 300 outputs just trying to calculate some kind of a, you know, doing coin join Sudoku and trying to figure out which inputs could have gone or broken down into which outputs or consolidate into, like, you know, all of the possibilities. That is just something that we have not with our hardware been able to, like, even do. So Well, KYCP doesn't either. On large yeah, transactions, exactly. they just go run it yourself because it's so computationally expensive. Yep. So it is like, you know, it's even if you have these amounts that, that like as long as you are not the big whale and a lonely whale in Wasabi 2.0 coin joint transaction, it is going to be very crazy hard to figure out the input, in, uh, like input, input, linkage input output linkage or output output linkage now there is extent then th some claims about like okay how about the uh, like post coin join activity uh, but we can go into that later but by itself like now in the wasabi wallet 2.0 coin joins 
there is a bunch of these so-called like privacy guarantees. So we have the traditional anon set, but we have much more things on top of it. And actually, I think, especially when we want to focus on change in coin joins, it's it's important to look at the, the entire user journey. And, and Rafi just hinted it in, in some regards. What, what about post mix, right? So the entire user journey is you have an arbitrary amount input value, right? And maybe that's not going to be enough as the minimum denomination uh, that the coordinator dictates in, in Whirlpool or Wasabi 1.0, for example. All right, so so then you have a problem and, and you're excluded. Um, but uh, so you have to consolidate multiple input coins in the same coin join transaction or TX0 transaction, which reveals common input ownership, at least to the coordinator with Wasabi 1.0 and to the entire blockchain with, with TX0 in Whirlpool. Um, which isn't great, right? And but then, okay, great. You you're now in the coin join. You get your private output amount of a standard denomination, but now you want to make a payment. And the big problem is, well, the payment, the merchant wants an arbitrary amount, and it's very likely not that standard denomination that that you have. So you have to consolidate multiple inputs to make a payment. Uh, and and it also, you you were going to have to create a change output, right? Because the merchant's payment output is is not the value of your inputs. Um, and then if the coordinator dictates certain input and output values in the coin join, this means that you cannot do a coin, uh, that you cannot do the payment inside the coin join, right? Like for example, in Wasabi 1.0, uh, like no, but no merchant wants to get exactly 0 0.1123 or something. Um, and in, in, in Whirlpool, well, you couldn't even select multiple inputs, right? The coordinator says you can only have one input. Um, uh, and no merchant wants to get the exact pool denomination. So this means in 1.0 Wasabi and in Samurai, you would have to make single user payment transactions. But single user transactions are horrible because we revealed common input ownership. And so now if you need to consolidate multiple standard denomination coin join outputs in your single user payment transaction, you just revealed common input ownership. Right? And then you have the merchant's payment out, uh, like output and your change output. Well, now the merchant knows that this is your change output and an outside observer knows that, well, this is the change output to a payment that was done by a coin join user. Um, and then you uh, will most likely want to get privacy back on the change output, right? It's toxic after all. Uh, so you want to put it into a coin join. Well, but the problem is by definition, you just made a payment with a standard denomination. So the change output is going to be less than that, meaning you cannot go back into the same denomination coin join pool right let's say in wasabi 1.0 you have you get a 0.1 output you make a 0 0.03 payment and you get your 0 0.07 change well that 0 0.07 change cannot be registered in the 0 0.1 pool um, meaning you have to consolidate to get into the coin join again um, uh, and that that sucks for privacy uh, so uh, the the change output is is such a huge problem not just inside coin joins, but also inside payments, which cannot be made inside the coin joins, both because of the entire idea of trying to prevent change. Um, but here is where Wasabi 2.0 really comes into shine. Like it just shows the in incredible benefit of, of having flexible uh, or arbitrary amount coin joins. Um, you can come in with any amount that you just withdrew from an exchange or whatnot and get only private outputs on the output side. Uh, and now you have a multitude of different standard denominations in your wallet after a couple of rounds of coin join. And now if you want to make a single user payment transaction, you can combine these standard denominations very efficiently uh, to reach any arbitrary payment output value with only a handful of inputs. Right? These standard denominations are good for decomposing, uh, like breaking down a, a large amount into many smaller amounts. But they're equally as efficient in taking a bunch of small amounts and adding them up to a precise large amount. Um, so with very few inputs, you can make any value payment. Um, but still, let's assume that you still get a change output back. Um, well, the change output is going to be lower than the standard denomination on your input side. But in 2.0, it doesn't matter because you can register as low as 5,000 Satoshis on the input side, regardless of what amount it is. Um, so a payment change output can directly be registered in the coin join. Um, and it, it can be registered together with private outputs that you have, right? So you can combine one or two non-private change outputs 
together with three or four private uh, coin join outputs, uh, which means now, even though one or two coins of yours are revealed on the input side, all of your other coins that you have on the input side are private. And so even an outside observer who might know that this specific change coin belongs to you, he does not know which other inputs you have and therefore the value of the inputs that you have. And if you don't know the value of the inputs that you have, it's going to be even more difficult to find out which output values do you actually have. Um, so ultimately with 2.0, we have a much smoother user experience that is, that is faster and especially cheaper and more private where you can get any arbitrary input value. And even after making a payment, you can register that change without any issue in the next coin join. I want to make an attempt to uh, steel man uh, Seth's concerns because I'm not sure he's gotten uh, like a satisfactory answer yet. So um, if I get if I'm getting this correct, the concern is that change when it's not fully eliminated, that it doesn't have um, another person of the same standard amount in the round to blend in with. Um, you know, are users getting a false sense of privacy? where they're assuming that um, their coins have been made private, but it's there's no guarantee. So I think Seth is saying that Samurai provides you guaranteed privacy because you get a predictable five anon set or score um, when you complete any given round. So there's some nuances to that, but... They, they can't guarantee that, though. They can provide a very high level of probability, but the only people that can guarantee that are the actual participants in a round. Yes, well, well, but I mean, even you no, know, I, I think what the point is is just on the blockchain transaction in Samurai. Well, I, I know, but I, I feel it, it is outputs. important to really drive home that point. I mean, that's true of everything. That's true of Wasabi Wallet because Wasabi could be just as easily similar. Yes, it's it's Samurai. rich. It's, it's well, that's a debate of the different fee structures. But the point is, like, just the structure of a coin join itself doesn't guarantee that. It's the participant set and their behavior. I think yep. focusing so, on the on chain footprint is more helpful here so that we don't get into the weeds of mm -hmm. civil attacks, though. Yeah, there's a lot of variables having to do with, um, with user behavior after they get their coins. So, yeah, just focusing on the coin join structure, uh, what Wasabi does here is that if you um, claim an output for which there's no matching amounts, right? To where, let's say I happen to pick 0 0.01 Bitcoin and for some reason, no other clients decided to uh, to pick outputs of that amount. My Wasabi client will say that I didn't gain any privacy on this. And for example, if you're a whale, if you have a thousand uh, Bitcoins, you get 990 Bitcoin change. It will also say you did not get any privacy for this, in which case you really didn't because you're the whale. However, if you're not the whale, if I'm actually getting 0 0.01 and no one else happened to get this, my client doesn't assign it as being private. However, on the blockchain, it becomes more private because there's not a clear input that, th that this belongs to, assuming there's like clusters of uh, input amounts around 0 0.01. So, or uh, lower amounts that can be combined to uh, add up to 0 0.01. So users will never under uh, mix because they will always get the minimum of the amount assigned to you from equal uh, amounts. So if there's 5.01 outputs, then you get a score of 5. If there's 10, then you get a score of 10, um, unless you have two of them, in which case it's lower. So you'll never get a false sense of privacy. It will always underestimate uh, the amount that you actually get. And are users prevented from spending until they reach some lower bound of that Anon score? Or how is it actually handled for the user when they're mixing? They don't gain the privacy they want. What does that look like to the user? And how do you prevent users from spending those funds anyways because they assume that they have privacy? Yep. So the way that appears in the client is... Um, a privacy percentage number. Uh, so we'll give you a private balance and a non-private balance. So your total balance is one Bitcoin and only uh, 0 0.04, or, or sorry, 0 0.4 has been made private. Then you have like a 40% privacy progress. 
and there's like a weighted an on score thing there but basically you will be allowed to spend 0.4 bitcoin privately if you try to spend more than that then it will alert you that a previous uh, sender or uh, or recipient via your change output would know that you're combining uh, or that you're sending payments that they would know about. Yeah, and also I just wanted to mention, like, you know, uh, trying to steel man the argument, uh, like you mentioned previously, Crow, uh, it would be basically that it would be crazy to say that you cannot have privacy unless there is anonymity set. That doesn't sound right. You know, there can be definitely privacy without having equal amount outputs. So, like all of these outputs that are coming from Wasabi 2.0 coin join that are not the whale output, we are not calculating. Like the client is saying that, yeah, these are not private. But in practice, if you look at the blockchain level, it is going to be crazy hard to figure out any of the linkages. But we are being conservative on the client. We're still not considering that enough. We want to have all of these three privacy guarantees kind of like met before we give it like uh, an annual score. And again, I, I just want to highlight of how how incredibly difficult this problem is. Uh, and it's not just a problem in general, it's also a problem in its specific application because you're a, a local wallet that doesn't have the entire blockchain transaction history or or, or just the, the coin join transaction history of, of this coordinator, or maybe associated coordinators. Uh, so it, it's just an extremely difficult problem and it needs to be performant as well right? because this runs on, on everyday computers. Um, it's it's just super difficult. Uh, what, what, what we have is, well, it works, <laughs> obviously, um, but it's, it's for sure not perfect. Uh, it can 100% be, be done a lot better. And there has been, by the way, numerous improvements to both the anonymity score calculation as well as input and output selection since Wasabi 2.0 was released in in June 2022. Um, th so this is this is definitely still a living software, and we're we're getting numerous feedbacks and improvements. Um, yeah, it, it's just difficult. <laughs> yeah, maybe just to kind of explain a little bit uh, of. What is Anon score again? Like I forgot to explain it in more detail previously. So imagine that you have a coin join round where you have, let's say, one, you have one of the outputs of one Bitcoin and there is nine other outputs that are also one Bitcoin. So normally we would consider that this, your coin has an set, uh, no, uh, yeah, an set of 10, right? So now, the thing is, we could previously say that with all of the three old implementations, because we had this idea that like only uh, like the user will have only one of those equal denomination outputs. That was the guarantee that kind of like what enabled all of these implementations to somewhat of at least use an on set as an estimation of how private did their output get. There is nine other outputs that are equal amount and each of the outputs are owned by different people. Now with 2.0 that is not true anymore. So there can be that you might have let's say two of those one Bitcoin outputs instead of just one. So what would be then your Anon set? Well it is again for each of the inputs, uh, no so for each of the outputs that you have like these one Bitcoin outputs, the Anon set is 10. But because we cannot know if all of the other eight outputs are also coming from different people, we have to be conservative. So there is certain calculation of how, like how we don't, like the Anon score is a conservative version of Anon set. So instead of like you having one of those one Bitcoin outputs, we don't give an Anon, Anon set of 10. We give, let's say as an example, an Anon score of four because we assume that multiple of these outputs might be actually from the same user, not all from individual, like different individuals. So that is kind of like an score. So whenever like we have in a wallet now, we have an score targets. When the user starts a wallet, he has to choose from different profiles and those profiles have a certain amount of like an score that they are targeting and automatically, the, like, whenever the 
like the coin join rounds succeed in a way that it, they actually do get this traditional anon set. We make an, a conservative calculation from that, and then we kind of in, like show it for the user that hey, you got privacy. So we are not even calculating or counting into our like privacy calculation the fact that it's like computationally just hard to figure out like all the possibilities of how the linkages could go in this coin join. We're not counting on this, like um, being able to break down the amounts into multiple different ways. We're being like ultimately very, very conservative, even like, well, more conservative than Anon set in the calculation of privacy. And actually, this made me just realize that every other coin join implementation doesn't really address this problem either. Um, join market does not give any privacy scoring or anonymity scoring at all if I understand it correctly. Um, they just cycle through mixed depths, uh, but but at random, basically. Um, if I understand correctly, Samurai looks at how many hops are your way from TX0, uh, but this approach only works if you have one input, one output in the coin join, which, which again has a lot of block space, efficiency downsides. And so Wasabi 1.0 was really the first coin join or the first wallet that implemented the concept of anonymity sets uh, entirely. Um, and that's why it was very specific to Wasabi 1.0. Um, and 2.0 changed a lot of things, and uh, we, that's why we felt the need to to upgrade the the anonymity scoring. Um, yeah, but but again, hey guys, this is uncharted territory. This is really complex, and um, nobody dealt with it in the past. Um, so the, yeah, we kind of opened Pandora's box with that idea of client side coin join collection on the output side. Um, but the cool thing is now that that allows us to add randomness client side, like I know exactly like a Samurai or Whirlpool client is going to behave. It has one input, one output, right? It's always the same. There is no ambiguity in, in how the client chooses its denominations versus uh, even in 1.0 Wasabi, I, I knew that if, if a user had like one Bitcoin input, he got a point 0.1 a point two and a point four and a point three change. Uh, and I knew how the client behaved. That was very deterministic behavior. Um, 2.0 Wasabi completely obliterates this idea. Uh, every, uh, the, the, the number of inputs that are selected has randomness. The, uh, which inputs are selected has randomness. Uh, how many outputs you select has randomness. Which output denominations you choose has randomness. Um, so yes, this makes it more ambiguous. You cannot say in the in the like right now you cannot say how the next coin join is gonna end up. Like what are the equal amounts there? You you, you don't know. Um, uh, but well, that's that's somewhat bad if you want to plan well and and if you want to know exactly the result that you're gonna get, you're not gonna get that with Wasabi 2.0. But neither does the adversary have that advantage over you as well. Because if the adversary, if the observer knows exactly how you behave, well, that's bad. Uh, but if there's computer-generated randomness in how you behave, that is a big nightmare for the attacker. Yeah, no, uh, thanks everyone for that. I, we're getting down to, I can only be on for another five minutes. So I wish we could keep this conversation going on longer, to be honest. It's been a great discussion. Uh, but if we want to kind of go around the table and go a final wrap up from all the speakers, uh, if you want to bring up anything that you're working on or where people can follow you to keep up with your work or anything that you're working on, uh, I'll kick it over to you guys. Maybe we'll start with Tebow and then we'll kind of go Tebow, Vlad, Max, Seth, Rafe, and then crew. Yeah, sure thing. Thanks for hosting us. It was a really good chat. Um, I mean, I would say just give it a try. Try the software. Try you know, Wasabi 2.0, try Samurai, try Join Market and uh, make up your own opinion of it. Um, and uh, keep digging. It's a deep rabbit hole. <laughs> yeah, so I just want to say that this was objectively the best Twitter Spaces conversation I've ever participated in. It was incredible. I want to thank you all for joining this. It was just everything I've ever wanted to know on the topic and explain with nuances and not in absolute terms, not with claims that are unrealistic and marketable. This was just incredible. 
I don't care to say where you can follow me and whatever. I, I want to tell you guys that this was very good and it just saddens me when I think that we're going to go back to Twitter and we're going to return to marketing terms and presenting stuff that maybe cannot be explained properly within the limits of a tweet. And it's going to lead to a lot of arguments and people are going to choose their wallet not on the basis of their technical merits, but on the basis of their ideological inclinations. And they will just go for the one that speaks in a way that appeals to what they're searching for in a privacy wallet. So that's unfortunate, but this was really great. And I wish thousands of privacy wallet users would listen to this and make their own opinion. Yeah, thanks for, for hosting this. I agree, it really was a excellent conversation. Um, I, yeah, I just want to highlight again that this is such a, like we're at the cutting edge of the cutting edge and it really is, is an incredibly complex problem. And a problem that I think all of us were ignorant. I mean, even I was ignorant during the Wasabi 1.0 days. Um, the, the, the nuances and the complexities of this problem it didn't occur un until you actually get that opportunity of, of client-side uh, amount organization. It's it's so this is this is going to be decades of research in the making, um, and uh, that's for for one ex extremely encouraging, but it's it's also a bit scary uh, because I know for a certainty that what we have currently with Wasabi 2.0 or even with 2.0.3 or wherever we're at now. Um, it is anything but perfect, uh, and we we really really need to take a lot of care on on figuring this out. Uh, it's and it's going to require a lot of effort from a lot of smart people, um, and yeah, good conversations like this are are hopefully a spark uh, to to keep those types of conversations going. Um, yeah, but uh, what we have now is I think good enough. Uh, looking at the blockchain, I think the results are cool <laughs> um and to to think that it can get even better in the future is is what keeps me working in the space um yeah well, especially want to say thanks to seth uh for coming here um that was uh, courageous and good good that we uh you know got some some good and, and harsh questions in uh that and some insights on how samurai works uh that, that's great um yeah and also thanks for uh, shinobi uh, with his surprise appearance, uh, he was quite instrumental, actually, in 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 seeding these ideas. Uh, you know, he was a big part of of adding multi-denomination to Wasabi 1.1. 1 .1. um, that uh, again, that kind of kickstarted this entire thing. So, uh, big thanks to him. Uh, he's been quite instrumental in the research. Yeah. So, uh, thank you, and let's keep building. Yeah, I think just for me. Uh, mostly was here just to listen and learn and, and engage and get some questions answered. So thank you to the Wasabi Wallet folks who are willing to jump on. You know, there's always a lot of vitriol between different privacy tools in the space, unfortunately. Um, it's not something that I'm a fan of or engage in, I don't think, but it's good to have these open, honest, nuanced discussions in a format that, like Vlad said, is not uh, not character limited because that, that only leads to bad things usually. Um, so yeah, thankful for the time, thankful for the insight, um, and definitely looking forward to, to learning more, trying to investigate, find out what's good, find out what makes sense. Um, and ultimately, I want privacy for everyone. Uh, I don't want it to be bound by a specific wallet or anything like that. So if the tools work, I'm excited. But definitely want to learn more about Wabi Sabi, play around with Wasabi Wallet 2.0, um, and yeah, learn a little bit more. So thank you all for engaging. Thank you all for all the information. Uh, and thank you, everybody who jumped in and, and listened today. Yeah, yeah, from my side too, like I really want to thank Seth and well everyone who's been here uh, listening and asking questions and discussing this matter. I think it's really, really important. Like it's kind of reckless for Bitcoiners to, who advocate for a lot of like self-sovereignty things to not care about privacy. And I'm really sad that to kind of see that, you know, the, the privacy discussion in this space is usually really like just crazy, stupid. Uh, you know, it's mostly like marketing and not being honest with the uh, the pros and cons of each pro each project and i think it would be really valuable for us to try to strive for that uh, i mean there's definitely things to improve in both projects we should just be honest about those facts and discuss them but yeah thank you very much for everyone
Yep. Thank you to Bitcoin Magazine and for uh, Seth for coming in with his thoughtful questions. Uh, the only thing I have to uh, to push and encourage people is to go look at a, a Wabi Sabi coin join transaction on the blockchain, because I think that like when you actually see it with your own eyes, it starts to make sense. Uh, kind of like the depths of the privacy that, that you're getting um, when you kind of like scratch your head and need a cup of coffee to try and figure out where any where any uh, input or output goes. So that's all for me. Thanks, everyone. I want to thank all the speakers for coming up and uh, discussing this. It, it's been a great conversation, and it was on a, truly an honor to uh, moderate this. I, you guys made my job very easy by the, uh, the nuance and depth of uh, questions and concerns that you guys all brought up. Uh, we hope to continue this conversation down in Miami, uh, May 18th through the 20th at the Bitcoin conference. If you haven't already gotten your tickets already, you can use code Satoshi to save 10% on your tickets down to the conference. Uh, but yeah, thank you everyone else for coming up and uh, discussing this. And uh, we will catch you guys uh, very soon. Have a good one, everyone. Bye.